today we're going to solve a problem. <laughs> this was on the second exam of the university business statistics class that I taught. It's pretty basic, a confidence interval, a round of proportion. I, I apologize for not bringing something more challenging. <laughs> when I first started teaching this class, I was surprised to find the majority of my male and female students dreaded their statistics requirement. At the first lecture, 60 grim faces stared at me like I was their executioner, <laughs> much like you all are now. <laughs> As a teacher, I couldn't veer from the curriculum or dumb it down to inflate my students' performance. I had to teach them to understand and solve problems exactly like this one. So I did what all good teachers do. I shared some facts that I thought would help. I told them that statistics is different from other math and that they may find it easier. That they could put aside their bad experiences and approach this subject specifically with a fresh mind and no baggage. This helped them relax enough to learn, and in the end, 117 out of 120 students that term passed my class with a C or higher. And in order to pass, they had to solve problems identical to this one. In fact, they solved this one. One young woman came into my office with tears in her eyes and told me this was the first time in her life she had ever gotten a B in math or even understood it. I came to realize it goes beyond just anxiety. We form an identity about being able to do or not do math. We or others label us a math person or not a math person, and then we tend to live up to that label. But there's no such thing as not a math person. Let me repeat that. There is no such thing as not a math person. If you have a human brain and can use language, you are a math person. Now, I can tell some of you are internally defending your status as not a math person. <laughs> so let's talk. <laughs> Mathematician John Allen Palos coined the term innumeracy to describe illiteracy with numbers. In our society, we don't think it's OK to remain illiterate, but we do give ourselves a pass if we're innumerate. We even make jokes about how bad we are at math. But think about it. Would we say, I'm just not a reading and writing type of person? <laughs> or, I'm more right brain and creative, so I really don't understand the alphabet. <laughs> According to mathematician Keith Devlin, math in our brains is related to language. Evolutionarily, we have always dealt with concrete numbers in our world, such as a pile of stones or a number of enemies coming over the hill with spears. This early numbers sense later combined with the abstraction of language to create a brain that deals abstractly with number. For example, we understand one, two, three, and extrapolate that to infinity, meaning, if we have language, we have math. Isn't that counterintuitive? Math and language are a package deal. So math anxiety is a phobia like any other phobia. It is learned, it is irrational, it is self-reinforcing. We become anxious anticipating our own anxiety, and it is defeatable. We learn math anxiety from parents and teachers who have math anxiety themselves, even when they don't verbalize it. One study showed that students' math performance got worse when they got help with their homework from a math-anxious parent. <laughs> They're helping hurt. This is how the cycle gets passed down. If we feel we're not a math person, we can probably trace it back to a specific bad experience or authority figure or time when we were told we weren't good enough at it. 
And even if we think it's too late for ourselves or doesn't matter anymore, we owe it to our children to break the cycle. The world our children will inhabit has a U-shaped economy. This means automation and technology are hollowing out the middle layer of skilled management type jobs. The choices our children face are low paying service work or high paying cognitive work. And the desirable jobs up here in a technological society require math. And numeracy is a cultural mindset. Stanford psychologist Carol Dweck describes the love affair Americans have with the fixed mindset, the belief that no matter what the ability, we either have it or we don't. With regard to math, being a math person or not a math person is by definition fixed because you'd be born with that brain, so you couldn't change it. Research shows Asian parents and teachers verbalize a growth mindset to their students, telling them anyone can learn math with persistence and hard work. Some may get it faster, but everyone will get it. The growth mindset is well known for producing cultures with math achievement across the population, not just at the very top or in one gender. Some clever studies have shown the power of these cultural beliefs. A group of Asian American college women was given a math test and their scores were somewhere in the middle. When another group of Asian American women was reminded first that they are Asian, their math scores went up. <laughs> when a third group was reminded first that they are female, their math scores went down. Nothing changed for them except the stereotypes, and it changed their entire performance. Speaking of stereotypes affecting math performance, Dr. Seuss had the first known use of the word nerd in his 1950 book, If I Ran the Zoo. Eventually, somehow, this word became the American stereotype of everything uncool. Thick glasses, plaid high water pants, pocket protectors, and oh yeah, math people. The nonfiction book and movie Hidden Figures, which documents the space race, reminded us that women were the original computers doing math by hand and later building software for early computers was still seen as a clerical job and attracted a lot of smart women. But from post-World War II into the 1960s, as historian Nathan Ensmanger recounts, a class of men had an interest in building computer technology into a higher pay and prestige male occupation. Professional societies developed that propagandized math and technical skill as related to nerd-like traits. They aren't. New employment tests look for disinterest in people and dislike of close personal interaction as positive predictors of technology job success. Our asocial computer geek was born. This campaign was self-serving, not research-based. And it effectively discouraged not only most women, but also all men who didn't want to see themselves as nerds from pursuing math-related fields. The real revenge of the nerds is that this stereotype protects status and resources and discourages competition for what are now the top jobs. Do you want those nerds to win? Back to my university students. I had told them that statistics is different from other math, and it is. It's harder. <laughs> I didn't tell them that part. <laughs> but I'm telling you today because over 97% of them succeeded anyway, because they are human, and therefore they are math people, just like each one of us.